Hey, my name is Stephen Gardner. I'm the best-selling author of Taming Wall Street, and I want to mentor you into having more money. And I'm doing that today on the Esme Lawrence Show, showing you how to sprint to success. Women are powerful and have accomplished great things. Yet, sometimes we suffer from self-doubt, fear, and limiting beliefs. We often believe that we are not good enough. These negative beliefs stop us from achieving our goals. Welcome to Sprinting to Success, a podcast dedicated to women who have experienced struggles, yet found ways to step into their power, their greatness, and learn to embrace challenges. These women will share their stories and give you insights to help you on your path so you can follow your dreams. And now, here's your host, Esme Lawrence. Stephen, welcome to Sprinting to Success podcast. I'm so happy that you join us on the show today. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on here today. Oh, so am I. So I want to ask you, so what is one thing that you're super proud of yourself about? Oh, well, um, I think seeing myself become a best-selling author on Amazon, that was a, a pretty big success. And, and since then, I've, I've published over six books. Uh, so I, I would probably say, you know, just making it into that category all on my own. I don't have a publisher. Um, I had to, you know, really research and seek out mentors that could show me how to author a book. But uh, yeah, one day I, I was laying in bed and somebody texted me and said, did you, did you see that your book's on the bestseller list? And I was like, what? This is, <laughs> this is crazy. So yeah, that, that's probably in the last few years, uh, the thing that, I, that I'm most proud of. Awesome. Actually, you know, I can relate to that because um, last year, actually, yeah, this year, I am, um, you know, I was an Amazon bestselling author um, and I was so proud of myself. I couldn't believe it. So yes. I can relate how, and then now you have six books. <laughs> yes. That, um, that's, that's awesome. So I, I and I'm really thankful that you have, you know, all these great successes, but I want to bring it back to as a child. Okay. What were some of the things that you struggled with as a child? Oh, um, oh, that's a good question. You know, I, I grew up uh, believing that I was dumb. Uh, I had a lot of energy as a child and uh, I, was, I was an auditory learner, but uh, our school system is designed to produce one kind of success. And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't meet that with my teachers. And so ultimately I, I ended up feeling like I was a bad kid or uh, not very intelligent. It wasn't until I was in my mid twenties that uh, somebody pointed out, Hey, you know, you're actually really smart, but have you ever considered that you were an auditory learner? And I, I didn't even know, you know, anything about it, but that, I mean, that was like a huge shift in my confidence, uh, in my mentality, the way that I approached uh, my business, uh, you know, other people, but yeah, just, um, I feel like the school system failed me because it, it was designed for only one kind of student. Right. And so he, um, here you are thinking that you're dumb. Yeah. So, uh, I had a talking problem What is it's funny, uh, you know, for entrepreneurs, they say, whatever your struggle is, uh, you know, becomes your strength. So now I'm really good at talking. I do. I went and did some public speaking this afternoon and um, uh, I, I've turned that uh, difficulty into a, a blessing or, or something to help me with providing for my family. But, you know, the main thing, like when I think back on it, uh, anytime I was uh, caught talking, I, I had to write it down. And, you know, at the end of the day, I just had a notebook full of time slots that I had been talking. It showed up there and then just being told, you know, like, you're, you're the problem child. Um, you know, you're, uh, you're not going to go very far in life. Um, I remember being spanked as a child in school, which shouldn't happen. Wow. You know? 
So it, it just seemed like I was always in trouble, but uh, I was, I was not a bad kid. And, you know, I, I remember thinking that like, you know, I'm not, I'm not causing any violence. I'm not um, mischievous. I just had a talking problem. I was very social. <laughs> right. Right. Now fast forward to so, um, yourself as a teenager. What were some of the struggles? Oh, I think, you know, just like anybody, uh, struggled with self-esteem, right. uh, being accepting of the changes in my body. Um, you know, acne, uh, was an issue. I was, uh, even though I was very social, uh, when it came to, uh, dating, I was very, very nervous, uh, very shy. As soon as I figured out that I liked a girl, I, I became very shy, but, uh, you know, I, all through uh, school, I just kind of kept my head down and, and did my own thing. I, I didn't really get involved with a lot of academic pursuits. That's but okay. uh, one, one connection to you was um, one thing I really struggled with was going into the 10th grade. I actually cut my finger off. Oh. And I, I'll tell you, my self-esteem dropped. It went from like 100 down to 1 right. uh, overnight. And I, I lost a lot of friends. Uh, because of that. And it, they didn't know how to relate to me. They didn't know how to bring it up. Um, and, and so I, I really struggled with self-esteem and had to, had to overcome that. And so the, the connection I was alluding to with you was uh, I wasn't allowed to play sports anymore. And I, I played baseball all growing up. So my baseball career was over because I couldn't, I couldn't take a ball to the hand because of all the nerve damage uh, there. So I ended up to, to pass high school, I ended up uh, going into dance and into track. Oh, track. So, Woohoo! I love so, track. Yeah. So here I was uh, forced to dance with all these pretty girls and come out of my shell. And then uh, during PE and after school, in order to, to graduate, uh, I ended up being on the track team. But my, my confidence was so low that when the coach would ask me, to, you know, do you want to be in the hundred meter or, you know, whatever the, the event was, I just said, no, I, I'm not good enough. I can't, I can't do that. I, so I, I really struggled with self-esteem. I, I know a lot of that had to do with, uh, just feeling, feeling, uh, stupid and, uh, then just being self-conscious about, you know, I'm, I'm missing a finger and, you know, so th I mean, those things really, really kind of messed with my head for many, many years. Not now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, definitely not now. I mean, I can relate to you because um, in high school I felt so stupid. You know, here I am coming from Jamaica when I was 12 years old. They put me back one grade. Then I went, then I went to grade eight and I failed grade eight. Then um, in, in Toronto, well, Ontario, at the time I went to grade 13. I failed grade 13 and it's like, oh my gosh, I felt like a, you know, very stupid. Even though I was an elite athlete. I felt stupid. So I can relate to that. So let's, yeah. uh, so let's fast forward. And of course, I, you know, that, that would be so difficult for you, you know, missing a finger. Now, how did you cut your finger off? You know, I, uh, I got it caught in a metal bending machine. Uh, the machine malfunctioned oh. and uh, it, was supposed to, it was supposed to come down and instead it went up and it just crushed my finger. And, and then when I pulled back, the finger fell off and it just blood everywhere. I mean, it was terrible. Uh, you know, I just barely turned 15. I, you know, I didn't know where my parents were and I was like, you know, use my boy scout skills, like just trying to apply pressure. But, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would have been devastating for a 15 year old. I mean, you have enough self-esteem problems as it is. Yeah. Get that finger crushed. And of course, losing your friends. Now that's major. Now, now let's go, let's go forward to that. You know, you're an adult. What are some of those struggles? Oh, uh, well, you know, being a business owner, uh, you're, you, you plan your day out, right? You think it's going to start here and it's going to just go one way. And, and, and this is the life of an entrepreneur, you know, it's like just up yeah. and down. And, and so, you know, I, I've had uh, really great years in business. I've had years where uh, there were major setbacks. I had, uh, you know, investments that did really well for people and, and others that uh, I had introduced them to. I wasn't in charge of them, but uh, they ended up having issues and, and then I had to jump back in and help. And, and really I didn't have any control over what was happening except for just to be a listening ear and, and try to help people through. So, um, 
you know, running a business, um, it, it takes a lot out of you, you know, uh, when you're a business owner, my wife's always like, Hey, when are you gonna, when are you gonna relax? I'm like, you know, uh, my whole company depends on me. So like my brain is thinking all the time, coming up with things It sees something It takes a photo of it, email myself. Okay, let's do this tomorrow. And so it's just, it's, it's nonstop. So I love what I do. That, that's a, a blessing that I can absolutely say. And I love what I do. Um, but just finding that balance between uh, the number of people that I'm helping and having that downtime. You know, I've got young children. And when I get done here, I, I always go spend time with them. My favorite time of the day is putting my kids to bed, which most parents are like, that's the worst time. <laughs> but because I'm just so busy and, and uh, working so much, uh, that's, that's my favorite thing. But yeah, I would just say, you know, the, the day to day ins and outs of, uh, running a business is, uh, like there's, there's no guaranteed paycheck, whether I'm working or not, there's no paid vacation, there's no sick time. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a lot of pressure to perform, especially in the financial world, because people want to know where's my money at, how's it growing, you know, they, they want that, to, they want to be mentored with their money, which I love doing. So, but yeah, there, there's a certain amount of pressure that comes with it, but I, I love it. I love it. I love seeing the way that's changed people's lives, especially women. Uh, I love being involved in that. Right. And of course, if you do what you love, money will follow. Yes, I, I, I believe so. I, I've, I've followed an opportunity and there's been times where I, you know, I had to cut my own path and it's worked out really, really well. And other times it was just kind of a total waste of time. But uh, in the end, uh, loving what I do is what gives me the energy to go longer than, than most times. Right. Exactly. Oh, it's to, like uh, one of my, one of my kids just came in speaking I, of which. That's okay. <laughs> you love what you do. And of course, you know, you love to spend time with your children, which is really nice. So I want to tell, um, so tell us, how did you go from, you know, low self-esteem to being the confident um, gentleman that you are now? What were some of the things that you did to, um, to you know, enhance your confidence? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, pro there's this idea, there's the, the I, me and the R, me, the, uh, the, the identity who I am. And then the R is the roles that I play. Uh, I'm a business owner. I'm a retirement planner. I'm a life insurance expert. I'm an author. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I go to my church, you know, those are all roles, right? And uh, men and women, uh, we tend to define ourselves or uh, value ourselves based on how well we're performing as an R, right? So, uh, oh man, I, I, I dropped the ball uh, with my kids. I, I'm, you know, I'm feeling bad or, uh, you know, I, I blew it with this client or I, you know, had an opportunity to work with this doctor and I said the wrong thing or whatever. And, and so we beat ourselves up in this column, the R column, and then there's the I column, right? And, and I don't mean to get like too spiritual or religious, but like, uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, I, I have a certain amount of worth as a human being, right? And so uh, on a scale of one to 10, I, I had to remind myself that as an I, I'm a 10. That's right. I, I, came, I came with infinite worth. I have infinite worth. I'm going to continue to have infinite worth, right? And, but I'm, I, I keep defining myself by my roles. And, and when I realized, wait a minute, I, I'm a human with infinite worth. But I'm also a human that makes mistakes and tries really hard and more times than not uh, succeeds. Um, but, you know, I, I can't keep judging myself on a daily basis based on the, the hat I'm wearing, the roles that I'm playing, you know, right. I, I just had to, I had to mentally shift over and go, okay, wait a minute. I've got infinite worth. I need to behave this way. And, and then, you know, going through a lot of self-help uh, material and going to seminars uh, was, was really big for helping me uh, get, you know, get from where I was to where I want to be. Um, I have a story, if, if you don't mind me sharing. I don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I went through a particularly hard time. I, I left the, the financial world to help my father-in-law get a business up and running. And, uh, that business ended up failing and I, I could see where it failed and I could see where I succeeded. And, and I learned a, a ton from that. 
But as I came out of that, I was, oh man, I was beat up. And I was like, okay, I'm going back to what I know I'm good at, which is helping people prepare for retirement, understanding a budget, getting out of debt, that kind of a thing. And, uh, but my self-esteem was like still attached to this company that had not done well. And it, it wasn't even my company. I was just the director of sales, right? And um, I, I went to this seminar and this guy was going through failures and successes, right? So he talks about like the author of um, The Cat in the Hat, how he was rejected by all these people and then eventually goes on to be one of the, the greatest uh, children's uh, book authors. And, and, you know, just all these examples, Oprah, um, uh, you know, all kinds of examples. Anyway, all of those were like, okay, this is, this is making me feel good. You know, that's the whole point of this. But then he said something that really hit me. He pointed right at me and, and, you know, the room was full. There was probably a hundred people there, but he pointed right at me and he said, I'm asking you to dream another dream. I don't care how beat up you are, how low you feel, you know, may, maybe you're at the height of your uh, career or at the bottom of it, wherever you're at, I'm asking you to dream another dream. And man, that hit me, that hit me like a bullet in my chest. I remember I wrote that down. I, I kind of sat back in my chair. And I was like, you know what? I got to start dreaming big again. I got to start right. thinking big. And, and, and you know what? Uh, my, my goals and my dreams have always got to be bigger than my problems. Right. And, and I mean, uh, I, whenever I run into a problem, I have to remind myself of that. Number one, I got to dream another dream. And my goals are bigger than my problems. And th that, that, that day, man, that was like... That was a game changer day for me. Transformational day. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I love that. You know, you got to dream big, you know, because I mean, as you said, you know, like, I mean, God made us to be 10 out of 10 and we put ourselves in boxes according to our failures or successes and, oh, maybe I'm, oh, I'm two or just, you know, limiting beliefs, but we need to step up to what God um, intended for us to do, to be, yeah. great, you know, to dream big and go after it. And, and failure shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't um, attach failure to our self-esteem because, you know, I mean, the, the business failed, the business did, not you as a person, yeah. you know, but, yeah. but it's so easy to uh, attach, you know, oh, a failure to ourselves or self-esteem. And then we start feeling low and not dreaming big. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you said that dream big. Yeah. I yep. You, yep. Yeah. Whoever's listening to this, uh, <laughs> this is my challenge. I don't care where you're at right now. I'm asking you to dream another dream. Dream and another dream. Just, just lift your eyes to the heavens and go, you know what? I, I got to have goals that are bigger than my problems and I got to get out there again. And, and maybe, maybe you've been through, you know, rough times, but uh, you know, you, you've got infinite worth. You've got more going for you than you realize. And, and I'm asking you to dream another dream. <laughs> dream another dream, ladies and gentlemen. I love that, Stephen. Dream another dream. It's, it's a game changer. Yeah, it was. I, I, oh, I, I love that. So now tell us about um, how, you, how do you help women in the world regarding finances? Yeah, you know, um, I got uh, a lot of pushback about four, three or four years ago. Uh, I decided that I was going to break from the industry norm. Uh, if you know anything about financial planning, I hate this, but it's like mostly men and it's, it's mostly driven towards men, right? So I remember going out on calls, you know, this over a decade ago and I'd, I'd sit down with the mentor and uh, he, he would sit down at the kitchen table with the husband and wife and he'd only look at the husband and I'd be like, why, you know, like, why are you uh, not looking at the wife here? And uh, she would make a comment and then he would ask the question to the husband. And I was like, okay, this is kind of weird. So anyway, I started noticing that over time. And then a few years ago, uh, I wrote a book called smartest woman in the room and, um, it, it, it did really well. It, it's a, it's a great book, but man, I got, I got a lot of pushback. Like, why are you, why are you wasting time on this? And, uh, you know, women don't make most decisions, but that's not true. That's not that's true. Not true. Uh, you know, most of the spending in, in, in uh, the world happens through women. Uh, right. Women control 70% of all of the money in the world. And, but when it comes to building trust with a, a financial uh, coach or something, most women go to the internet because they don't want to ask questions 
or most of the resources are, are driven towards men. And so I, I try to uh, make sure that I'm including women in my message. I, I, I've got that book, as I mentioned, which was really weird. I, I mean, I even felt kind of weird writing it. Like, why is a guy writing a book for women? But over and over again, I would get on the phone with, uh, with people. And I, it, it was the women that really were, you know, asking the good questions. Right. And so I, I shifted towards that. And my, my book of business is about 50-50. Uh, it, it's not skewed towards men, uh, like, like most people in my industry. And so, uh, a, a few things that I'll, that I would just point out is, is that, uh, you know, women have so much control of, of the money out there. Uh, but we need to make sure that that financial education is there with the right information. Women could really take off and, and just do really, really well. Um, the other thing that, it, that I do, I do a lot with insurance planning is um, 80% of men die married and 80% of women die uh, single, widowed, or divorced. And so it's so important nowadays for women to have that financial education, have assets in their name, uh, have a plan for what they're going to do. I was talking to this, uh, this, this couple and the, the woman said, well, I don't know if my husband needs any life insurance. We've, we've got a lot of money. And I said, I know you do. That's why I want to work with you. But I said, here's the thing. You love your husband so much that when he gets to the end of his life, you're going to spend most of your wealth trying to keep him alive. And then he's eventually going to die and you're going to outlive him statistically. Right. But now you're going to live with significantly less money. Wouldn't you want a big life insurance plan to pay out upon his death and replenish all that money you spent while he was alive. And the light bulb went on and she was like, Oh wow, you're so right. You know, women statistically outlive men by many, many years. Um, and, and so, but they, they, uh, they don't have the, the resources and the tools that they should. And a lot of that is our failed education system. Uh, you know, I went all the way up through, uh, I, I graduated from the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah, and from preschool all the way to the top of the university, no financial education is happening. Right. And it, it, it's, it's terribly sad. And uh, so that, that's the mission I'm on, is to strengthen America one family at a time. And uh, women, you know, they play such a huge role in the American household now and, and even around the world. Uh, but they, they don't have the, the same tools that, uh, the industry is producing for men. And I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get that education and those tools out to people. And that's great work that you're doing because you really, it really is important to have life insurance, you know? And so for the women who don't have life insurance now, what's the first step? Well, I, I mean, that's not the only thing I do, but, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, my, my book, Taming Wall Street, that's probably my most popular book. Um, and it's, it's, it's about 50, 50 examples of men and women. So I would, I would say, start getting some financial education, uh, and then let, let's figure out what's the appropriate route. Do we need to work on getting out of debt right now? Do we need to work on becoming a more disciplined saver? Um, do you already have money, but you don't really have a plan for it? You've just been a good saver, but now we need to get that money invested and really growing. And so we, we have plans where people can sock money away and they've done really well. They've been earning between five and 9%. Sometimes they even get into the double digits, which is nice. Uh, and, or we have plans that just grow by 5% or more every single year and have a lot of tax advantages. So, uh, but yeah, with life insurance, uh, savings, getting out of debt, the, the key is financial education. And, and that's where I try to step in and, and go, okay, listen, um, you're only as good as your mentor, right? right. And, and so let me just take you by the hand and, and walk you through. I mean, I, I've read hundreds and hundreds of books on the topic. And so let, let's start by just picking my brain. But my job is to download some everything I know into somebody's mind so that they don't have to spend, you know, thousands and thousands of hours reading like I have. I love reading, you know, so uh, <laughs> it, it's not a thing for me, but um, if, if I can help people, you know, get that, get that information, that that's what I want to do. I, I just want to educate people. And maybe that's because, 
you know, my mother was an educator for 35 years. My grandpa was an educator. Oh, nice. Uh, you know, I decided not to become a teacher, but in, in some sense I am. Um, that's all I do. I just educate people and let them make their own decisions as far as which route we want to go. And if, if what I present isn't a fit, then I'm a no pressure guy. We just walk away from it. So right now, what's the best way um, for women to start saving money? Uh, well, um, you know, you, ha you have to have uh, material to build a suit, right? Uh, uh, every now and then people come to me and they're like, I've got no money. And I'm like, well, I can't make a custom suit with no material. So the, the first thing is we got to make sure that you have income and then we got to make sure that you have surplus income. And then what can we do with that? Do we need to use that to drive down debt or do we, do we start saving? Um, do you have an emergency plan in place? Um, are you uh, owning your own debt? We, we can show people how to take back control of some of, some of their good debt. Uh, the difference between good, good debt and bad debt, because uh, there is a major difference and most people don't know that. And so um, I, I just, you know, everybody, we're going to work with each person on a unique custom basis because, you know, 7 billion people, everyone has different backgrounds, different level of income. But I would say uh, the biggest thing is people have to have a vision for where their money can take them. And right now, uh, I, I'm running into people that are like, you know what, I just don't even want to save. You only live once. Uh, I'm just having fun. And when we really get down to it, 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 it comes down to two things. Number one, the banks are paying such little interest that there's no growth on their money. And right. number two, they, they don't know how to run the calculation to see how their money could grow over time. And so if I can show them a better place to save money, number one, and then I can show them, okay, if you can save $200 a month or $1,000 a month or whatever the number is between now and age 65 or 70, here's a huge pool of money that you'll have and, and they can't see that all they can see is the next month and the next month and so then right. because they lack that vision uh they they can't even see themselves and I, i'm sure you ran into that with running you know you had to believe that you could win that race right. and you had to see yourself go out and do that and if you can't do that you're going to get crushed every time oh right? definitely yeah. definitely so i'm um, so Stephen, a lot of people are in debt especially at Christmas time when they're going to, you know, uh, rack up that credit card to buy gifts. And then after the new year, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in debt. What are some of the, um, maybe what are some of the advice that you would give to get people out of debt? Yeah. Well, the first thing is we, we need to get all of your debt onto one piece of paper. Uh, too many people I, I sit down, I mean, I, I sit down with smart people a lot and they're like, uh, I don't know where my money's going. I'm like, okay, that's the first thing we need. We need like one Excel spreadsheet that as a snapshot, you can see here's where all of my money is going. And then we can start systematically saying, okay, do you really need this? No. Okay. Do you really need this? No. Uh, could we change this around? Um, you know, you're, you're saving uh, money in a 401k earning 3%, but you've got a credit card at 27%. Maybe we stop the 401k and start diverting some towards getting out of debt. But unless you know these things, you just keep doing the same thing. And unfortunately, you know, people that are in the habit of getting into debt go further into debt. So we got we to stop that spending, get some education there. But then again, once, once people can catch a vision for when they could get out of debt and what that feels like. Um, I remember um, helping a, a couple down in Texas to uh, wipe out their debt in about four or five years. And then all of a sudden they had like $1,500 a month and they're like, well, what do we do with this? I'm like, you start getting rich, baby. We start putting that money away, you know, That's and then right. in the future you can control your debt a little bit better and, and go after some good debt. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot of people that are carrying bad debt and the, these uh, credit card companies, they're, they're charging crazy, crazy rates. Like I was even just looking at uh, one of my wife's accounts I say, you know, this visa is a 27% interest. And she goes, yeah, well, I usually pay off the balance. And I'm like, okay, but yeah, if you miss one time, you're getting yeah. hit. Now. That's over 2% a month. That's, like, a lot. Oh, okay. That's a lot of so, money <laughs> out of your account. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. And that, I mean, so, uh, you know, I, I think 
people just need to understand that there are systems for getting yourself out of debt, but if you don't know how to do them or you don't have the discipline to stick to it month in and month out, then you're just going to, you're going to continue to stay in debt. But it's really not that hard. Again, if you have someone who's been through the, been through it all, it, it's a little bit easier with a mentor. Right. And ladies and gentlemen, a mentor like Stephen would be great for you to um, help you get out of debt. <laughs> so, so Stephen, um, take us back. Um, so with all the knowledge you have now, you know, and all the successes and the knowledge, go back and talk to your, um, your young self. Okay. What advice would you give your young self? Oh, um, as far as like money or as far as running a business anything, or self-esteem? Any, anything, anything regarding, okay. um, you know, so maybe, maybe self-esteem, that might be the best. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, that, okay. so that he can feel you know, better about himself. Yeah. Um, I would probably go back and tell myself, you know what? Uh, every year you're going to compound your knowledge and experience and you're going to end up being this really resourceful person and have all this knowledge. So just stick on that path. Uh, I, I also wish I could go back and tell my younger self to start reading earlier. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you know, I didn't really start reading until I was, gosh, almost 20 years old. And, well, uh, you know, it's better late than never, right? <laughs> yeah, but now, you know, I, I'm nearly 40 years old. I, I've almost got a couple decades of just, you know, all that. And, and that's what people don't realize is, you know, we, we talk about compounding wealth, uh, which we can easily do with people. But um, if you have a lifelong learner mentality, you, you're compounding tremendous amounts of wealth and, and life experience that's going to be helpful to people down the road. Oh, definitely. It's really important to, um, to educate yourself. And reading is one of the best way to do it. And of yeah. course, you know, learning from others that having a coach, a mentor will also help you. So, um, so Stephen, what would you like to share with our audience today? Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, uh, if you're looking to uh, control your money going into 2020, then, uh, you know, let's just, let's just do a word play. Uh, let, let's have 2020 vision for your financial future. Let, let's go in, let's look at what's going right, what's going wrong, and then let's, let's make a plan that, that gets you to retirement in the least amount of years and with the most amount of money. But you know, that, that's what I do all day long. And so, uh, but I like that. Yeah, that just came to me. Right, <laughs> 2020. That's awesome. Let's get a 2020 crystal clear uh, money plan going into next year. That, that's what I would say. And, and you know what? Uh, it, it's exciting. Uh, I have a postcard, uh, or not a postcard, excuse me. I have a picture of myself uh, and I'm, I'm tearing up a, a, an index card that says, get out of debt. And I'm standing by a fireplace. I'm in a polo shirt. Like I can still see it in my mind, right? And what most people don't know is I carried that index card in my pocket for three years. Because I just knew that if I had the get out of debt uh, card in my pocket, then I was going to be focused, right? And every nice. time it got too dilapidated and beat up, I'd tear it up. I'd write out get out of debt, right? I did that. And then finally I ripped it up. And my wife and I have no debt, you know. Uh, oh. Other than other than our our mortgage, um, and, and and in taming Wall Street, I show people how to own their own debt. So I have a lot of good debt, but it makes me money and and gets me tax write offs and stuff, which is pretty cool. That's but awesome. um, you know, now it's carrying the become wealthy card, and and uh, you know, carrying that with me. I don't have it on me right now, but you know, that's now my focus because because I've overcome some of that, and and I love watching people when I build out these custom plans like I show in Taming Wall Street and they go, wow, I, I never knew I could have that kind of money in my lifetime. Uh, it's just that discipline, putting money away and then having it in a place that's not going to lose money. It's not going to be affected by taxes as much. Uh, it's going to grow. It's just, it's really cool to see like somebody that hope rush into them like, oh man, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. <laughs> I've got a plan. And, I, and, and of course, I can do it, right? I can do it. I've yes. got a plan. Yes. I love that. I love the fact that you bring a card, a wealth card, or get it a debt card. And you can, the reason why you do that is because you can see it every day. Look at it and, and, and remember your goals and your dreams. Yep. Yep. You got to have those goals written down. <laughs> right. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can learn more about Stephen at EsmeLawrence.com. Thank you for listening to Sprinting to Success podcast with your host, Esme Lawrence. Thank you and have an amazing day. And hey, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity.
Thank you for listening to Sprinting to Success with your host, Esme Lawrence. Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this show on iTunes. For more information about Esme and to hear other episodes of the show, go to EsmeLawrence.com. The information in this podcast is not intended as a substitute for professional or medical treatment or advice. Always seek advice from your healthcare provider.